at chapter 7, we need to talk about ionic compounds, okay? Ionic compounds are formed from our cations and our anions, and that sharing or the transferring of electrons, okay? Although they're composed of ions, ionic compounds are electrically neutral, and we're going to deal with these again in chapter 9. Chapter 9 is probably the hardest chapter for the first semester um, because we have to learn how to name and formula right all compounds that we're going to deal with in the second semester, okay? So that's important to know. Because the cations and the anions have opposite charges, they're attracted to, the other, to each other by an electrostatic force. These forces that hold them together in ionic compounds are called ionic bonds. The anion in an ionic compound will take the electron from the cation to achieve noble gas status. So the, no, the cation is donating that electron to the anion, okay? And that's how those things are formed. So let's consider sodium chloride, okay? Uh, what's the symbol for sodium? Na. Na, okay. And let's draw the electron dot structure. So how many valence electrons does sodium have? What column is it in? One. one. So it has one valence electron. So I'm going to go ahead and just put my one dot right there. It doesn't matter where you put it. Okay, and then we have chloride means chlorine. So how many valence electrons seven. are on chlorine? Seven. So it doesn't matter where you put your seven, but just go ahead and put your seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so these are the atoms, but in order to create the ionic bond, what happens is the cation forming one, which will be the sodium, will give its one electron to the chlorine. So as a result, what happens is, so this is like after it's done, the sodium no longer has any dots around it because it donated away its one. And then the chlorine now has eight. Okay? So that's what happens when it takes and gives away the electrons. So this is where we get our charges from. So the sodium gives away its electrons, so it's going to have a plus one charge. And the chlorine accepts the electron, so it's going to have a negative one charge. Okay? So that's an ionic compound being formed. The ionic bond happens when you have that transfer of electrons from the cation to the anion. Okay? Any questions? All right. That's ionic bonds. Chemical formulas. So sodium chloride is NaCl. Have you ever seen it written like that? That's a chemical formula. Okay? We are going to deal with chemical formulas more in Chapter 9. It's all about naming and formula writing. But a chemical formula shows you the number of atoms of each element in that representative unit of the substance. A chemical formula is not necessarily meaning that if I have a sample of sodium chloride table salt, I don't just have one sodium with one chlorine. I have a bunch, but I have a bunch of NaCl's in that sample, okay? With a chemical formula, what we can do today is figure out a formula unit, okay? So a formula unit is a ratio of the total ions in that compound. And so we use what are called subscripts, the numbers that are lower, to figure out this formula unit ratio. So looking at sodium chloride, the ratio is one to one because when you have your formula, if there's no subscripts, then you imply that there's a one there, okay? So one to one. If we had a compound like magnesium chloride, which is MgCl2, what's that ratio going to be? One to two, because we have one magnesium, because there's nothing there, so we imply one, and then there's a two after the chlorine, so that would be a one to two ratio, okay? What about if we had aluminum bromide? That would be one to three, because there's one aluminum for three bromine. Formula unit ratios, are those too difficult if I give you the formula? Yes. No. Okay, so some properties of ionic compounds. Ionic compounds are mostly crystalline in structure, meaning that they form crystals. And they are usually solid at room temperature. 
they can have a very high melting point, meaning that they won't melt just under certain conditions. They have to have specific conditions in order to melt. They're going to mostly be solids at room temperature. And they can conduct an electric current when they are melted or when they're dissolved in water. So this is a case of where, like, you know, when you get a new ele electric appliance, like a hair dryer, a toaster, or a straightener, or something like that, curling iron, and it might have on the label, do not use, like, in the bathtub or near water. And that's because our tap water has ionic compounds dissolved in it. And so because they're dissolved, there's that chance of passing an electric current and getting yourself zapped. Okay? So those are properties of ionic compounds. Coordination numbers are our next thing. Coordination number is when you have an ion and then how many ions of opposite charge surround that ion in the crystal. So this is what sodium chloride looks like. Okay, sodium chloride has a coordination number of six because the sodium has six chlorines surrounding it and the chlorine has six sodium surrounding it. The way that you tell is in this picture, there, it's, think of it as a cube, and I'm going to show these in a second, okay? But, so we have sodium three deep here where we have one right here in the middle, okay? The way that you identify the, the coordination number is if we're looking at sodium, how many chlorines are next door neighbors, okay? So we have one, two, three, four, the sides of the cube, and then we also have on top and on bottom those two. We're not assuming that the ones on the corners are next door neighbors because there's more space in between. So that's how we get our coordination number six. On a test or something else, I would not ask you for these type of coordination number. We would have something like this. Okay, so if we have cesium chloride, here's cesium in the middle, and I want to know the coordination number for this. So what would it be? <coughs> We're going to count the chlorines are the green ones. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight around it. So that means it had a coordination number of eight. Does everybody see that? <laughs> Anything? So if I asked you for coordination numbers, I would ask for something like that, not the other kind. Okay. So those are all ionic compounds. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about metals instead. For a second. The bonding in metals is very different than ionic compounds because the electrons are free floating, meaning they don't just stay around their original element or atom. They go around and share between all of the atoms connected. So metallic bond happens when you have a force of attraction between the free floating valence electrons and the positively charged metal ions. And this is what holds metals together. So like on my scissors right here, I have metal and that's what's holding it together. Okay, the free floating electrons. These free floating electrons, the sea of electrons, is helpful because this is kind of what makes up the properties of metals. Okay, one property, which we use this for a lot of things, is that a metal is usually a good conductor of electricity. And that's because the electric current is carried between the, the change or the movement of the electrons to the positive cation to the electrons to the positive cation to the electrons to the positive cation. Positive cation. Metals are always going to be positive cations because they're on the left side of the periodic table. Okay. Um, so that carrying happens really well in metals. That's why you're not going to hold up a golf club in the middle of a thunderstorm because you will, might get electrocuted. You never know. Um, they're also very ductile, meaning that they can be stretched into a long wire, like we have copper wire in our house. They could be malleable, meaning that they can change shape. You can bend them, you can hammer it, you can press it, you can melt it down and pour it into a mold and have a new shape. So all of these characteristics are important and they are a part of metals because of this sea of electrons happening, okay? The next part, um, we have our crystalline structures. And there's three types that we're gonna talk about. Hexagonal close packing, body center cubic, and face centered cubic. Okay? So, and these three are 
the next three headings in your note packet in italic bold print. So if you can't really see up on the board right now, you can just look on the next three sections on your note packet and that's what they are. Okay. But the reason why we have these three packings is because the metal ions are spherical. And because of the spherical shape, we can predict how they're going to arrange themselves. And these are just three. There are more ways than just this. So I'm going to move on, but these three things are those headings, so in case you didn't get to run them down, just look at those next headings, okay? So the first one is hexagonal close packing. <laughs> We're going to abbreviate that HGP, okay? In this structure, we can see a hexagonal pattern. So if you look at the bottom left picture, I have, when you look at the side of it, you should be able to see the hexagon. So I'm going to connect the centers of the atoms. So if I go here and then there, like that, you see the hexagon? And you can find a hexagon in another spot in that same section. That's not a very good hexagon. <laughs> My bad. But so when you look at the side, you should be able to see the hexagon. Another thing is when you look at an atom and then you look at a crease, like a seam in between two atoms, so if this is our seam right here, directly above and below that seam should be another atom centered on that seam, above and below, okay? So if you look at my, which people on the video won't see this, but if you look at my, this is my model of hexagonal close packing, okay? And if you look, here's the hexagon, right? Then if I'm looking at a seam, so here's my seam, then directly above and below that seam, complex and the most difficult to understand. Next. Next one is body centered cubic. So we will abbreviate that as BCC. And in this one, you have one atom that's in the center of everything. And then the other atoms that surround it are only touching that central atom. They're not touching each other. Okay. So that's why it's called body centered cubic. It's centered around that one in the middle. And this model's kind of falling apart. But I have my atom in the middle, and then on each corner, there's another atom there. So body centered cubic is sometimes the easiest to determine because of that one in the middle. Okay? Um, that's that and then. Last but not least, we have face center cubics, and that'll be abbreviated FCC. On this one, you have your box, you have your cube, and they're in alternate, alternating layers, but in the middle, there's an empty space. So the reason why it's called face center cubic is if you're thinking about your cube, and then each side of the cube is a face instead of a side of the cube, directly in the center, of each cube side is an atom in the middle. So that's why it's face centered. Okay? So any way I turn this cube, and I don't want to fall apart, you would see that in the middle. Okay? Another thing, that empty space in the middle of the whole thing is there because of that arrangement. Okay? So this would be face centered cube. So after talking about these three things, let's look back at the sodium chloride picture. Can we determine what type of closed packing is sodium chloride? Body centered? Body centered? Face -centered. Or face centered? Looking at the chlorines, it's a little bit easier to tell for the chlorines. So when you look at the chlorines, does each side have an atom in the middle? Yes. Is the, in the, do you have a chlorine in the middle? No, you have a sodium in the middle. So this would be face centered cubic. Okay. 
And then last but not least, our last vocabulary term, as you finish out chapter seven notes, are alloys. Alloys are a mixture of two more elements, at least one of which is a metal. And they're important because their properties are actually often superior to their original components. So, who can think of an example of an alloy? Brass. Brass is an alloy. Yep, what's another one? Rims. Rims, like on your car. Yeah, those are alloys usually. What else? Bronze. Bronze. Yep, bronze is one. Bikes. Bikes, like what do you mean on the bike? Like what part of a bike? The frame of a bike or an alloy? Yeah, what else? Steel. Yeah, there's a lot of different types of steel. Yeah, metal. Jewelry is usually an alloy. Um, jewelry, so if you ever go to the jewelry store, which this is really cheapo, but like if you ever hear like 14 karat gold or 20 karat gold or 24 karat gold, that karat number is a measurement of how much gold has been put into your jewelry. Because gold is very malleable and not very strong, so they mix it with other metals that are still pretty expensive and precious. They're called precious metals but it makes it a stronger and more durable jewelry. And so that's when you hear those carrots, that's what it's talking about. So that would be a, an alloy. So that's it for chapter seven. We are done. Well, now they know.